Thank you so much, T, and thank you to uh, uh, everyone supporting our, our access today. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, and tell you um, about um, what, what you're coming into today. I'm going to hand it over to Maisha very soon, uh, but just wanted to say this is the last of our Media Justice Fundamentals Spring Series. Um, we've been doing um, a lot of 101 education workshops um, in the series. Uh, we had a Ecarceration 101, a Media Justice 101, um, and a Racialized Disinfo 101. A lot of these um, really speak to the foundation of our work and um, our campaigns. Um, and today we are diving into Protect Black Descent 101. Uh, and with that, I will pass it to Maisha. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear and see me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Um, well, I'm super excited for today's MJ 101, and thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, as many of you know, we lead a campaign called Protect Black Descent. And so, you know, the purpose of today's workshop is to really dig into the history of surveillance that has so much shaped um, that campaign and so much of the criminalization work that we do at Media Justice. So. Um, again, my name is Maisha Hayes. I'm the campaign strategies director at Media Justice. I use uh, she and her pronouns, and I'm also based uh, at, in, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I would love to hear or know a little bit about who else is in our virtual room today. So um, if you could take a moment uh, and just share your name, your pronoun, um, your org affiliation, if you have one, and the city that you're in, in the chat, that would be great. Um, and we're actually going, while folks go ahead and do that, um, awesome. So cool to see new and familiar faces and old, uh, old faces. Um, I'm going to pass it to Dulani to actually walk us through um, the icebreaker that we're going to use in a minute. Thank you, Maisha. Um, so we're going to be uh, using uh, the platform Slido today for our icebreaker and for another activity after that. Um, and there are two ways to participate with um, Slido. There is, um, you can go to slido.com and enter this number 685-410. Um, or you can use your camera phone and scan this um, QR code that is in the top left corner. Um, and when you do that, you'll be able to participate in our icebreaker question. Cool. Thanks so much. Uh, so our icebreaker question for today is name one word that comes to mind when you hear the word surveillance. Okay, capitalism, watching, we see government here, monitoring, control, everywhere. Okay, this is speeding up. Uh, policing, <laughs> stalker, spy, okay. Stalker 100, I see that in the, in the chat. COINTELPRO, ooh, okay, we getting ahead of ourselves. Um, we're gonna get into that in a minute. Uh, white supremacy, two words, that's, that's fair. Criminalization, sorry, I missed that one. Interesting. Secret, yes, that's a big part of how surveillance works as well. A lot of it is done in secrecy. Cool. Has everyone had a chance to participate? Control, that's right. Data gathering, yes. Especially today, all of the different tools we use. Stealing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
these are definitely concepts that we're going to get into in some of the activities that we're going to do and the presentation on the Protect Black Descent campaign as well. Noticing no one has said safety, which is great because that is the a uh, dominant narrative about surveillance and a narrative that we often like challenge in our work at Media Justice. Um, so we wanted to, you know, do this icebreaker and ask this question just to start get us thinking about how surveillance has been a part of uh, the fabric of the United States response to our liberation movements. And we're going to get into that today. So I'm going to pass it off to Aaron to get us into our first activity. Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Erin. I am a national field organizer at Media Justice. I use she and her pronouns. I'm currently joining you from Louisville, Kentucky today or my, with my family, um, but I'm normally in D.C. Um, and, you know, as Ray just said, the word of the day today is surveillance. And uh, during that icebreaker, I saw some folks sharing, you know, COINTELPRO as a touch point. Um, for surveillance in the US. Um, and so I wanted to double click on that. We wanted to double click on that. And so um, what we're gonna do is have a little pop quiz about COINTELPRO called, what do you know about COINTELPRO? Um, before we dive in, can anybody come off of mute and tell me what, or tell all of us really, um, what COINTELPRO stands for. Does anybody know? This is the pre-quiz, not the quiz itself. <laughs> What's the counterintelligence program? Counterintelligence, can you say, uh, tell us your name, your pronouns, and uh, any affiliation you have? Uh, Benjamin Stone, they, them. I'm with the uh, Urbanisha and Bahain, Urban, excuse me, Independent Media Center. Absolutely. Uh, and and COINTELPRO said... was short for uh, counterintelligence program. It was it was Perfect. the FBI discrediting all the leftists, uh, all the people of color, et cetera. Wait, 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 wait. We're gonna get into it during the pop quiz. <laughs> You're a star pupil. Okay, already. All right, let's go. Um, so okay, so we're gonna be using Slido for this again. Um I am not a thousand percent familiar with Slido, so we're all gonna learn together. Um, but we can follow Zulani's instructions at the beginning. So use your camera phone and just like hover it over that square box at the top left. Um, or you can type it in manually using that code at the bottom left. So first question is, when did COINTELPRO take place? During what time period? So here we have from 1965 to 1968, from 1956, to 1971 or from 1963 to 1969. And we're gonna give folks just a minute or so to get those answers in. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so 73% came through was 1956 to 1971, and you are correct. Wow, but that's, you know, I'm doing like heavy air quotes here because we were having a conversation before, like, did it ever really end? We'll have the conversation today, actually. Um, so I think it'll show us a leaderboard after this. Benjamin, you're our leader so far. Well, actually everybody's leading, honestly, but I think it goes by how quickly you do it. So that's really cool as well. Um, let's move to question number two. Who did COINTELPRO target? We have black booksellers, the young lords, which hopefully folks are familiar with, the American Indian Movement, Reverend Dr. MLK Jr., anti-war groups, the Black Panthers, or all the above. Get your answers in now. I wish we had like the ticking music, like do 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 do. We'll give it just a few more seconds. Okay, go ahead. Oh, 
Do people not? We only have a few people. I think you need to that scroll answer. down. Maybe. Oh, scroll down? Yeah. Oh. I was like, wait. So the vast majority of folks uh, said all the above. And if you said that, you're correct. I was I was a little shook for a second. I was like, wait a minute, yes. <laughs> um, the person who said anti-war groups, you're also correct. It was just all encompassing, right? So it, take a moment to let that sink in. You know, do folks really find this especially surprising? Uh, and, and we can think about like, even though that's like a really long list, there are definitely people who are missing from this list. So are there are there folks who are missing or like groups of people who are actually missing from this list that we could add? Why don't you drop that in the chat there? I know that when we were talking earlier, we said that, you know, feminist groups were missing from this. Teresa, you had mentioned, yep, the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, yep. LGBTQ movement leaders, really anybody who was, you know, trying to challenge the US government from consolidating power and solidifying its surveillance apparatus, right? Um, so I think it will give us another, like who's in the lead now. Let's move to the next slide. Still Benjamin, but Gretchen, you're in there too. All right, next question. How was COINTELPRO revealed? JFK held a press conference. Malcolm X pointed out an FBI snitch at a rally who confessed. Or anti-war activists leaked FBI files. Add your answer now. Just kidding. I'm not going to make you all suffer through that. Um, all right, let's go and see what people chose. Ooh. Okay, 100, 100 emojis in the chat, please. Thank you. Anti-war activists leaked FBI files, all right? Um, so in April 1971, a group of anti-war activists who are actually just like, you know, cab driver, daycare worker, and two professors, broke into an FBI office in Pennsylvania. Um, and they actually broke in the night Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, which I didn't know this, uh, had been, uh, were fighting and had the nation's attention. Um, and so the folks who broke, it, broke in planned to destroy any draft records uh, they found for the Vietnam War. But they also ended up uncovering the sort of vast surveillance program, which had yet to be revealed to the American public. Um, and uh, so yeah, they were shocked, really incredibly shocked to find this information. And they took every single document they found and leaked copies to five recipients, three journalists and two members of Congress. So let's see, let's go to the next one. I think we'll see the leaderboard. Benjamin still holding strong to that first place. Next slide, please. Okay, the final question is, what was the purpose of COINTELPRO? To destroy movements for self-determination and liberation for Black, Brown, Asian, Asian, and Indigenous struggle. To sow division and distrust within progressive movements. To mount an institutionalized attack against allies of these movements and other progressive organizations or all of the above. We'll give it a minute just for folks to get their, their answers in. All right. Let's see the, the uh, response. 100s in the chat again, folks, you're all right. All of the above, okay? Um, this was explicitly documented as the purpose and seen and how it was carried out. Um, and so now, we're, I think I'm turning this over potentially to Maisha, but we're gonna watch a couple of short clips uh, to learn more about this sort of history of surveillance and COINTELPRO uh, within the US context. Benjamin, we don't have a prize for you, but you did win. <laughs> 
Um, all right, let's go. I think Dee is going to queue us up for um, those videos. Thanks, everyone, for playing with us. Thanks, Aaron. And um, yeah, just a heads up, as Aaron was saying that the leaked documents were sent to a couple of journalists and Congress folks. Um, out of those five people, only one person actually took action in terms of sharing it with the public. And so one of the first clips we're going to see is from that journalist who ran the information in the post. All right. Um, can y'all see my screen here? Yes, Somebody please. say I can't see anybody. <laughs> we can see. We can see it. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. One of the things that I remember most from those files was the, the truly blanket surveillance of African-American people that was described. It was in Philadelphia, but it also prescribed national programs. It was quite stunning. First, it described the surveillance. It took place in every place where people would gather—churches, classrooms, stores down the street, just everything. But it also specifically prescribed that every Every FBI agent was supposed to have an informer just for the purpose of coming back every two weeks and talking to them about what they had observed about black Americans. And in Washington, D.C. at the time, that was six informers for every FBI agent informing on black Americans. The surveillance was so enormous that it led various people, rather sedate people in editorial offices and uh, in Congress, to compare it to the Stasi, the dreaded secret police of East Germany. Three of the burglars also appeared on Democracy. Back in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s, the United States government had programs, some involving simple surveillance, some involving ways of getting information, some involving plots, now basically to frame people for crimes, and some involving outright murder. One of the first documents that the FBI issued, that J. Edgar Hoover issues, that constitutes what could be called a COINTELPRO document, was really issued against the Puerto Rican independence movement. In this uh, missive that J. Edgar Hoover sends out to the San Juan office is that everything has to be done, that you should gather all pertinent information, including personal information, on the independence leaders to expose them that will lead to divisions, that will lead to disruption and the destruction of the movement. Oh, um, we're going to play this one a little later, Dee. Um, oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> uh, no worries. Thank you so much for for cueing those. Just just some short expert, uh, excerpts, as folks saw. The first one from that former Washington Post um, journalist who who leaked it and was just talking about this sort of mass mass surveillance. I mean, we, we know that leftists were targeted and uh, organizers and activists were targeted, but the way that she was describing how it was just really indiscriminate surveillance of Black folks um, just really speaks to the racial profiling that we that we know so well today. Um, and uh, those last two clips were from a, a film called Cointel Pro 101, which is available on Vimeo. And um, the two clips we saw just one, the first one briefly spoke to the tactics, um, everything you know from the informants to outright murder. Um, and then the the second clip we saw was just lifting up the the 
intentional targeting of the Puerto Rican independence movement and how it was very similar tactics around um, sowing division and distrust, mass surveillance, really keeping tabs on folks. Um, so a lot of stuff that we discussed in the quiz, but um, yeah, from, from there, since Cointelepro is one of the most well-known uh, surveillance programs, we, we wanted to start there, but we're actually gonna jump into what did surveillance look like before Cointelpro and after? Um, so we're going to do a timeline scavenger hunt. Um, the instructions for which are in a participant guide, which I think I might have forgotten to mention that earlier, but we have a participant guide for folks. Um, and that includes um, the agenda for today and the instructions for our um for our timeline scavenger hunt and what we're going to do is just break up into four groups um and each group has a prompt and the participant guide is a google doc where folks can write down their names um and their discussion and then we'll hear back from each group a one minute report back um on the history you were discussing and the highlight of your conversation um thank you for dropping that link, Teresa. Um, so folks, the link is in the chat. Um, and Dee is going to uh, break us into groups. Um, page one of the participant guide, like I mentioned, has our agenda. And if you scroll down to page two, it's the instructions for the scavenger hunt. Um, each group has a specific point in history that they're going to examine and and then share with the groups. So we're all learning from each other. Any questions on what we're about to do? Awesome. Thank you. Take it away, Dee. OK, thanks. Um, OK, so I will be opening up the breakout rooms in just a second. If you need um, access to the captions, the ASL interpreters or the Spanish language interpreters, please, um, I'm going to send everybody out, but then you'll have to come back to the main room um, in order to be able to access those. And you can have the uh, your own breakout room in the main room with the with those um, uh, assistants. So uh, you will see a timer in the upper right corner um for how long you have left in the room and you then you will be you will have 60 seconds um, until you're forced back into the main session okay here you go Okay, I think this is everybody that's a working. So um, if anybody comes back, then I'll put folks into the facilitator room um, and leave the interpreters here, but I'll give it a second. Um, so how are we doing? We're good on time and everything? Yeah, it looks like we're right on time. Okay. So I set, I set the rooms for seven minutes, considering they have an extra minute to, till they come back. So that's like a total of eight, just, you know, so it doesn't need to come back. Yeah. Wait, does it go to 5.30 or six? Six. Um, Patri and Ellie, and we don't actually need, looks like no one's uh, requested it for the breakouts, so you can have a break. <laughs> Same for you, Dion. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So it, it looks like are there just our folks in three rooms? Um, yes. Okay. 
So yeah. I think that'll just adjust. Um, yeah. Right, because there weren't very many people. Yeah, totally. Like two, yeah. Sorry, but I just, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I just realized that you had four groups. Uh, that's okay. We can adjust. So the fourth group was going to talk about, oh, the war on drugs. Um, uh, it's really okay. Cause like, yeah. I don't touch on it that much in my, I don't really touch on it during my presentation that much. It was just like to give folks another example of you know, other agencies that are kind of empowered with more surveillance tools and power to criminalize people, mm -hmm. but it's not the end of the world. Um, Aaron, you were so awesome as a quiz host. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I was trying to do, you know, do my Vanna White, but I wish I had some like music that I could play while people were writing things down <laughs> or, you know, submitting their things, but. Yeah, it was time for sure. I also felt like I couldn't see myself at first. <laughs> That's why I was asking, can y'all see me? But I had to change my my view you would think after all the zoom yeah you can would know, but <laughs> we could see you yeah you could just pin yourself you're already she probably already know that you would think at the end of the series i would know how to be in the right zoom room. <laughs> <laughs> caught it in time somebody though, so all good Who is the um, blank square? Hmm. Do you uh, see that? Is one of our interpreters. Oh, okay. I was, that's what I figured, but I was like, oh, I didn't know. Since, since we're good on time, I don't know. We could give them another minute. I don't know. Hey D, after the two minute clock, do they get another minute after that? Or like countdown clock? Is that right? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Did you guys get this alert that the that the prosecutor? And the shootings in Atlanta is going to pursue a hate crime like law and then the death penalty. What was this for the massage parlor shooting yes. that we're talking about? Oh, wow, that was sick. I mean, hate yeah. crimes, yes, death penalty. Whoa. Yeah. I don't know. That's horrible. <sighs> yeah. Somebody, oh, um, I think it was Adrian Mary Brown had re had reposted had posted about how she was reading rereading Bell Hooks's All About Love and the grief chapter, and it made me pick that up again. And it it was just amazing how much it just talks about the culture of death in the U.S. and mm. how obsessed it is like we are. Whether that's what that that's what you made me think of. With like, I'm like, great, that's really gonna fix stuff. The death penalty and especially i mean there was just another mass shooting yesterday there was one in new york the other day in times square and then there was one in colorado springs it's terrible i feel like colorado's kind of up there with uh florida mm. with their shenanigans 
because yeah, I don't know what, maybe it's just the, the news cycle that hits, but I feel like really horrific stuff happens in Colorado. Definitely shootings. Like they they've got weird gun stuff. Yeah. It's like almost like Nevada in a sense. What tell me when to stop talking when people are coming back in, but like, um, I interned on the Hill for Senator Reed's office, Leader Reed, and this is like when I was really young, and they would always talk about how Nevada is really strange, like it's liberal, but I'm doing air quotes here, like liberal, um, but then they have this really strange gun culture and like don't tread on me culture, like libertarian, but then they always vote Democrat, so I feel like Colorado is kind of similar in that sense, like they have an interesting... Um, I don't know. It's like a, they're kind of in multiple places when it comes to like politics. All right. Looks like everybody is back. All right. Welcome back, folks. How was that? Um, we did. We kind of made you do a lot in a short amount of time. Did you did you run out of time? <laughs> um, apologies. Um, I'm sure you were having great conversations. Um, so hold on to all of the thinking um, that you were doing that maybe you didn't get, even get a chance to share in your groups because um, we can go into that now. Um, let's start with um, group one. What what did you what was your prompt and what was the highlight of your conversation? Who's in group one? The lantern laws. It's all right, y'all. Don't be shy. Can we hear a little bit? Who was in group one, just generally? <laughs> um, was anyone in group one? Was this a group that? Hmm. Huh, well, maybe we should assume no one was, that. maybe that was the group that we didn't assign folks into. Uh Maybe. Uh, well, we can go into. Um, well, yeah, we can go. We can start with. I would like. Two. Oh, go ahead. Do you want me to like just briefly kind of explain what the lantern laws were? Since. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so there's a really great book um, called uh, "Dark Matters" on the surveillance of blackness by Simone Brown. Um, that I highly recommend everyone to read and check out. I think like the intro is free online, um, but essentially I we wanted to raise that up here because these days you hear organizations like ours talk so much about the different tools that the police are using and we get kind of like bogged down in the terminology and like the tech of it, of it all. And the purpose of starting with the Lantern Laws is to give folks a sense of how surveillance existed before there was even prisons and policing. Um, so lantern laws were essentially laws um, during American chattel slavery where black and indigenous folks had to carry um, lanterns after sunset. And essentially the, the reason why folks had to do that was to make themselves visible for being watched. Um, and Simone Brown talks about this example. She talks about um, branding, which like I know so many of us, you know, are familiar with uh, as a cruel practice of punishment, but she also makes the argument that by branding, you know, uh, the bodies of enslaved um, black and brown people, this was actually a way of making the body a literal marker that you can um, track and surveil. And she argues that this is the earliest form of what people these days call biometric data, <laughs> um, which is just body measurements, right? Um, and she also talks about like um, runaway slave ads that were used, right? Like using again, 
the markers of people's bodies to describe quote unquote stolen property um, at that time. And so we just wanted to uplift um, these examples um, from you know the 1600s as an example of how you know being black or brown in America you are exposed to being profiled and that you know that 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 logic has pretty much consisted throughout history and just been further institutionalized through the creation of law enforcement. So um, ooh, I want to see what's in the chat. We are living Confederate markers. Yeah. Any questions or thoughts or reactions to that? Because I didn't know that before I came to Media Justice and that kind of like was really interesting to me. Um, so again, the book is called Simone, Br I mean, the book is called Dark Matters by Simone Brown on the surveillance of blackness. Maisha, I think one thing that I think of when we've talked about this before that just kind of strikes me as interesting is like, at least in DC where I live, like we're, we often have like in poor neighborhoods where they say that there is crime, they'll put huge spotlights up, you know, so just like, you just don't have darkness. Like that is a sense of, that is, that is a privacy, of, you know, that is a privacy protecting function. That's right. We have that in New York, these gigantic, enormous, ugly, police camera lights just like I have one like over down the corner basically that's right and it reminds me of how like after slavery you have sundown towns so black and brown folks again after sunset can't move around freely in public space if they happen to pass by white you know only communities like we think of Jim Crow so much as like you know the era of segregation but so much of segregation was a tool to actually monitor and surveil and criminalize the movement of black and brown people in public space. So um, you can think of all of these strategies as, as you know, the bedrock of some of the surveillance tools that we talk about later. Thanks so much, Maisha. What about group two? Who was in group two? Palika? Hello. <clears throat> I was in group two. Where are my other group twoers at? Hey, yes. So um, we had the Palmer, gosh, what was it called? The Palmer Raids. And um, I think one super interesting fact that uh, we took away from it was that the Palmer raids were the reason, um, what were the spark for the ACLU's creation, had no idea. Um, and so it makes sense now that the ACLU takes on so much surveillance work since that was really uh, what they grew out of. Benjamin, would you add anything to that? Uh, no, honestly, the two of us were having a great discussion back and forth as we were reading the Wikipedia article to each other and being startled by facts and didn't have time to take many notes. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the thing we were curious about is where the surveillance came in, because we were skimming and it kept mentioning the role of the media, but it didn't mention much, like it didn't go into detail about that in the Wikipedia article. So we were curious about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you both. And, and for folks, um, who might not be familiar, the, the Palmer raids happened like 100 years ago at this point, over 100 years ago um, in like 1919, 1920, it was a part of the Red Scare. Um, and actually Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, who was an architect behind Cointel Pro, um, was also behind the Palmer raids. Um, and um, I think, you know, when we think about who it targeted it targeted a lot of immigrants and leftists um and so it's it feels like one of the earliest examples of criminalizing leftists and using federal resources to target them um and justifying criminalization for national security how that always happens in relationship to war um and this question about surveillance is is a good one. I think I think the media's role in even the hyping up of the Red Scare and what there is to be afraid of um, was was definitely a factor. Um, and beyond that, I think I still have a lot to learn in terms of surveillance um, uh, in that era. Does anyone else want to lift anything up? 
Um, no, I agree. I feel like I also have a lot to learn in that area, but from what I've read and from what I understood at the time, like they would really watch people's, um, like, because they were surveilling communists, socialists, labor activists, they, what I was reading was that a lot of these agents would follow people to their meetings. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, but sort of like the monitoring that happened around like the Palmer raids was kind of like the training ground for what COINTELPRO became later on. They just evolved those like monitoring and like pretty much stalking <laughs> uh, strategies. Um, Sandy, I see you off mute. Do you want to, did you want to add to that? No, I mean, I think that's right. I was just going to say, and like mapping, I think mapping of the communities was a big, was a big part of that. Thank you, folks. Um, let's go to group three. Chris, Roxy. Hey. Yes. I was in group three. Um, it was myself, Roxy, and Jin. And um, our prompt was around the Watts riots. And um, the question was, why is the history of the formation of the SWAT team significant? Um, so we had a short clip and a little part of an article. Um, learned that SWAT team, um, while it stands for Special Weapons and Tactics, um, was almost called the Special we Weapons Attack Team, um, but that that was too harsh, they realized, so they changed the name. Um, not really the goal, because it was a military-type style response to civilian disorder, and it was a way of getting around um, yeah, they, it was a way of them getting around the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878. Um, so it was basically, I mean, in our group, we talked about how instead of um, having a response where they, after the Watts riots started, after an experience of police brutality and the community um, rioting and, and protesting and standing up and speaking out about that instead of going to the community and um, figuring out the needs and how to like build better relationship they decided to build a separate police force that operates on a higher level of aggression um, and and so basically a way of getting around this like act of 1878 which says that we can't have like militarized forces and uh, like um doing law enforcement, they just created like a second layer of policing um, that is allowed to be uh, and expected to be a lot more aggressive and dangerous. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Benjamin, great question. So you know, we, we've been seeing so much about, you know, military tanks in places like Ferguson and, you know, all of this huge militarized response to protesters. Um, and there's, there's a history behind that. There's a history be, behind the police being militarized um, for military type equipment and that level of, um, sort of tactical strategy against civilians, against peaceful protesters, against um, Black Panthers, like that's, that all was happening at the same time. So um, really we wanted to, to dive into all of these things when we when we think about surveillance. Um, from the, the xenophobia of the Palmer raids, uh, connecting that to, to the war that was happening, um, to uh, the militarization of, of the police force, um, and even back back to the lantern laws. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, folks are raising their hand. Um, Roxy, do you wanna go and then Gretchen? I was responding to Benjamin. Mm -hmm. oh, it's okay, really yeah, interesting because yeah. we just had an event here that brought some high power activists down to Galveston because of the treatment of some of the visitors to our island. And what's interesting is the military style vehicle is parked right in the park light it's not hidden, it's not, it's like parked right out so you can see. And it's interesting how they made some adjustments because due to our natural disasters that we experience here, they use that as an excuse to move out some of our lower income residents. And when they were rebuilding the jail, 
the Justice Center is like right as you enter the island. It's almost as if they're saying, if you're a black or brown, we only want you to make it through the island because the Justice Center is right there as soon as you cross the causeway. So it, intimidation, exactly, Benjamin. So it's really interesting how all of this in its different forms is still very much alive in the society that we're in now. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone else want to add anything? Awesome. Uh, thank you for participating in this scavenger hunt. Um, just wanted to uplift some some history. Um, and I think from from here, uh, we have one more short uh oh is there one more group yeah, yeah. i thought we i there is one more group but i thought that y'all are on a time limit so <laughs> oh no no <laughs> yes share out if you want <laughs> yes please <laughs> we were group four with uh gretchen and catherine i believe um and in it was basically talking about 1971 1973 in which nixon declares the war on drugs and then creates the dea or the uh Drug Enforcement Administration. And we chatted uh, really about how, you know, this aligns with the, some of the goals that were referred to and mentioned earlier of how it criminalizes and disrupts uh, Black communities and our leaders. Um, and I think it was also like a really clear uh, example how, which uh, policies are used to like further insti or, or institutionalize, but like further and advance mass incarceration and the privatization of, of prison industry. Um, which then spills into like harsh sentencing, deportations that is uh, really racialized or hyper racialized. Um, and we talked about, you know, how that, that disruption uh, really derives people of, of, of rights or protections, thinking of like taking away rights to vote, federal student aid, uh, access to public housing and uh, food stamps and so on and so forth. So that was that. Thank you for that report back. Yes, the DEA. Um, and there's been some, um, you know, as recently as a few years ago, um, you know, some headlines about the DEA using NSA um, data um, and spying on protesters, on George Floyd protesters. And so it's just over time, all these agencies have just grown more powerful, um, both in terms of their surveillance power and their militarized power. Um, and so that's just something we wanted to, to point out today um, as we go into our campaign. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it to Maisha and Sandy um, to talk about our Protect Black Descent campaign. Yeah, that's super important. And I think the other thing I might add to is that some of the intention here was to show how like over, I don't know, we've covered about eight years so far, but every, you know, a few years is an, another crisis, whether real or imagined, where, you know, we see the FBI say there's some sort of crisis that they have to respond to. And whether it's like the war on the Red Scare or the war on activists or the war on drugs, right? Like, you see really similarity, like, in, in strategies and tactics to, like, criminalize our communities. So, um, really appreciate that that thorough report back. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, give me one second. Okay, cool. So more presentation, y'all. I'm gonna go from the beginning. Um, so what we wanted to cover in this part is we're going to repeat a little bit about what we just talked about just to continue to ground us and how we got to black identity extremism and why we've launched the protect black descent campaign um so i know we already talked about COINTELPRO, but i wanted to touch on it again really quickly um just because it's such an important part of history and so relevant to our work um because the creation of the fbi in 1908 1908 really marks the beginning where we see um, the police go from criminalizing and monitoring just 
um, our movements in public spaces to taking on formally this role of criminalizing um, political movements and political dissent. And for years, as we just discussed with the infamous J. Edgar Hoover, um, he claimed that the United States was facing this national security threat and um, this rise in domestic violence from immigrants and communists and, and labor activists. So I just wanted to like underscore again that from the beginning, like really from the beginning, the <laughs> inception of the FBI was really created to protect the interests of the status quo by criminalizing um, and destroying the political movements of its time. So resisting against capitalism, fighting for workers, your immigration status, essentially made you a criminal and a national security threat. Um, and so as we discussed before, they targeted members of the civil rights movement, the black power struggle, the anti-war movement, the Puerto Rican independence movement, the young lords, like the American Indian movement, anyone that they considered a part of the left got targeted underneath this program. And I just wanted to touch on a couple of strategies. By no means is this really even an exhaustive list, but just some like patterns that I've been noticing that really remind me of some of the work that we do today. So the first, the first tactic is criminalizing dissent um, by labeling, labeling activists as quote unquote terrorists and threats to national security. You have um, a strategy around conducting psychological warfare by placing FBI agents as informants in different movements, right, and different organizations um, to gather information to sow discord and distrust between activists. You know, we have instances of folks sending anonymous letters trying to encourage violence, extortion, blackmail, like spreading rumors. I mean, the list really goes on and on. You see, as we kind of talked about with the creation of SWAT teams, right? Um, this information sharing and collaboration between local and federal law enforcement so that local you know, police departments can really execute the ongoing harassment of activists by conducting you know, vehicle stops and violent raids that we all know about um, that you know, resulted in the death of Fred Hampton. And of course, at the time, they would use any sort of technology that existed to monitor and surveil the movement of you know, leaders at the time, right? So obviously there was no such thing as social media, but they would use you know, photo like photos to track people and their associations. And they would regularly like wiretap um, people's phone calls. And frankly, you know, we're still actually learning and uncovering the extent to which tech companies at the time were complicit in the government's war against um, the political movements of its time. Um, one thing I, I didn't learn about until I came to media justice was the fact that the night of Fred Hampton's assassination by the Chicago Police Department, people at the time told a reporter at the LA Times that they saw Illinois Bell Covans, which were essentially like AT&T back in the day, right? Um, in the neighborhood, the night of his murder and the days leading up to his murder. And those witnesses told this reporter that they had problems, you know, receiving or making phone calls that evening. And it was such a well known like fact at the time that even Hampton's lawyer um, sort of suspected that the Bell Company had actually cut off phone access at the request of local police and the FBI and was considering like legal strategies um, to hold the company accountable. So, you know, as we talked about earlier, COINTELPRO was exposed by a break-in by anti-war activists um, who really wanted proof of the government surveillance of um, its movement at the time. And they stumbled across all these documents, including one on COINTELPRO. And when they leaked this to the media, um, all of that attention and pressure really encouraged Congress to actually take action and investigate the FBI for surveilling our movements and violating our First Amendment rights. Um, so I'm actually going to turn it to Sandy to dig into a little bit what the church committee was, which is, a, I think, also really important part um, of this history around surveillance. And then we're, we're going to, she's going to take us through some of the reforms and laws that happened since then and kind of help contextualize where we are now. And then I'm going to talk about the campaign. Yeah, thanks so much, Maja. 
and everyone in Media Justice. Um, I'm Sandy Fulton. I'm actually with an organization called Free Press. Uh, we work super closely with Media Justice, definitely one of our closest partners, um, doing open internet work um, and surveillance, and specifically surveillance of communities of color and activists, hence the connection with Media Justice. I personally do a lot of our congressional outreach. Um, so right now I'm going to do some, I'm trying to explain some of the like just legal history and like a big picture of how stuff has played out at the government level, um, just to kind of put a timeline around major events and how Congress has responded and basically show what politicized policing and racist policing looks like in policy. Um, but again, I'm going to try and keep it big picture. Um, sorry, I'm gonna, and I will go slower. My interpreter is talking to me. So yes, as Maisha explained, following Cohen's Pro, the church committee was created to investigate what happened. This was this was considered a shock, so Congress reacted. Um, a Senate committee, it was actually called the, called the church committee because the head of it was Frank Church, his last name. Um, so a Senate committee was tasked with conducting a massive investigation into the nation's most secret agencies. And this is the the first and only time that this has ever been done in American history, which is, which is shock, shocking in itself and, and pretty alarming. Um, and what they found was that Hoover, who was increasingly paranoid and a little out of control, like more than a little out of control, had been, in, had been in charge for decades, was literally doing whatever he wanted with zero oversight. There was no control for anything that was happening under COINTELPRO. There was no process. National security, and terrorism had been held it, at the executive level. So Congress had had really like, just kind of like had were excuse me, were just hands off. It was a so it was a new concept that they that they would even engage. Um, so after uncovering the extent of these programs, basically the committee really just tried to establish a process by which surveillance would be conducted so that protections could be put in place and that there could be some accountability because after COINTELPRO, there really was no, no one to hold accountable for what happened because there was no process. Um, I don't want to get super wonky into what they recommended to Congress, partially because I'm not a lawyer, but also because I just think, you know, we're talking bigger picture and kind of narrative. And I think that's more important. Um, but I want to talk about some of the big things that they did to try to establish some checks and balances over these agencies. First, um, they created intelligence committees in the House and in the Senate. So this is the first time the members of Congress would receive confidential briefings on the regular from the intelligence community. That was to an attempt to create some congressional oversight. The big thing they did was that they recommended that Congress pass the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is called FISA. This was a law specifically created to regulate government surveillance around national security. And it created the FISA court. Um, that court would create a process by which surveillance programs would need to be approved. This was considered pretty revolutionary at the time. Like I said, the, the intelligence community had never been investigated. Congress had never created any sort of oversight. So just creating that court was considered a big, de was considered a big deal. And I think it was a big deal in its day, at, in the beginning. Um, and that was meant to be a real check on the government spying on, on U.S. citizens. That court did put in place strict restrictions against spying on First Amendment protected activities, as well as spying on Americans in general. And I think those are really the big legacy reforms from the church committee policy wise. Um, but I think as much as anything, it was just a cultural movement where people were shocked, mainly white people were, were shocked by massive abuse from these, these uh, agencies. And there was a willingness to rein in law enforcement which we do not see very often. Um, at that time, you know, well, folks know the FBI was in pop culture, Hoover had become this, this popular icon, you know, so just the willingness to even try to tackle this was a big deal for the time. Um, now the next big moment we're gonna, we're gonna jump to, because as Maisha said, like when the, we only really get attention on these things when there is a crisis or a perceived crisis and Congress wants to do a thing. So the next big moment we're going to skip to is September 11th and the war on terror, um, which is a bit of a leap. But so I want to say that, like, you know, between those times, all the while, law enforcement is trying to get all those tools back. You know, they, they are lobbying, they are chipping away at rules, they are finding loopholes, they are adopting new technologies that are not regulated at all because Congress is not doing their job. 
because it is not popular to be critical of, of police and law enforcement um, in Congress. And most significantly, those safeguards, the intelligence, the, the intelligence committees and the court are becoming friendlier and friendlier with law enforcement and the intelligence community, which is super problematic. Um, they are becoming co-opted by the folks they are meant to regulate. This happens across Congress. You know, always hear about this happening with companies, but it certainly happens with cops. You know, they're 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 beating down the doors. They're like, there's there's going to be a bomb. Like, do you want to be responsible for the next bomb? Like all that stuff. And instead of being an oversight committee and and reporting to Congress on what the intelligence community is becoming, they are protecting the intelligence community community from Congress, which is super problem. Uh, super problematic. Um, sorry, my notes. Today, literally, the intelligence committee is the most hostile place for for civil liberties or privacy. Just full stop. Um, but yeah, so moving forward, September 11th happens, and law enforcement and the Hawks see an opportunity to take a sledgehammer to any remaining protections from from the Church Committee, um, and the Patriot Act. <clears throat> excuse me, is is quickly drafted. Um, the bill is famously rushed through Congress. There is no significant debate of what it does. Um, and as we know, the Muslim American community will bear the brunt of, of the abuse that comes along with the Patriot Act. That being said, the tactics are all very familiar to what we have seen during COINTELPRO and, and before. So just general dangerous, racist, and disruptive police work, just this time, it is of a religion instead of an ideology. We see, we are seeing spying, we are seeing mapping of communities, we are seeing infiltration. Um, but, and again, not to get super wonky, but to a little bit go into what Patriot specifically did. What I think Patriot did that is, is most um, kind of important is they created, it created the modern national security exception to privacy protections, which is something we deal with all the time. Every time there is a law that is supposed to be privacy protecting, there's a huge loophole that says, you know, yeah, we'll protect your privacy unless it's a matter of national security. And they kind of created that in the in the modern way, in the modern uh, America. It also guts judicial review of those exceptions. So basically that, that FISA court that's supposed to be this check, now the government just has to go to them and literally say that the search or the program is a matter of national security or terrorism. And that is now the law of the land. So those first amendment protections are gone. Those protections against spying on US citizens are gone. And now the FISA court is a rubber stamp for spying. You know, it kind of, it, it just not to get super wonky, but like the way it works out in policies, you know, it guts the First Amendment protections by using language saying that an investigation cannot take place, and I quote, solely on the basis of protected activities. Like that's the kind of legal language they're using. So we kind of see how that can be exploited. It wasn't solely based on that. But it was a big part of it, you know. Um, another significant thing that happens after September 11th is the repeated revision by the Bush administration of what are called attorney general guidelines. Um, this gets a little wonky, but I'm going to tie it real closely to what's happening right now as well. Um, so the attorney general guidelines are guidelines that exist to advise on how investigations should be done. One particularly dangerous thing they did after September 11th was create a new kind of investigation called an assessment, I quote, it's called an assessment, which required no factual predicate to open up this investigation. So no, no factual evidence that criminal behavior was happening and they could open an assessment. So an assessment is like a pre-investigation to the investigation. But the assessment can only last for so long before you actually need to find evidence to open an actual investigation. I'm sorry, I know the language is weird, but that's, that's what it is. Um, and these assessments can include searches through government or commercial databases, overt or covert FBI interviews, using informants to gather information about anyone or to infiltrate any lawful organization. So this is a massive loophole that swallows any First Amendment protections. And to get a sense of just how big that is, from 2009 to 2011, the FBI opened over 82,000 assessments of individuals and organizations. Less than 3,500 of those justified a further investigation. So this is, you know, after 9-11, going into, into infiltrating mosques and, and spying on Muslim Americans, mainly. There's one like kind of like really sad, famous example. There was a mosque in LA 
where the head of the mosque actually called the FBI and they were like, hey, there's some guy at, at our mosque and he's he's talking about weird stuff. He's like talking about maybe violent stuff. And they like turned him in and the FBI had to admit, they were like, oh, that's one of our informants. Like he was there trying to pull people into doing bad things. Like that's just heartbreaking. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that was happening. It also, it also authorized the FBI's racial and ethnic mapping program, which allowed the FBI to collect demographic information to map American communities by race and ethnicity for intelligence purposes based on racist, this is ridiculous, based on racist stereotypes about the crimes each group would commit. For example, the FBI mapped Chinese and Russian communities in San Francisco for organized crime purposes, Latinx communities in New Jersey and Alabama because they are in street gangs, and Black people in Georgia to find Black separatists, and Middle Eastern communities in Detroit for terrorism. So that, that they, they were mapping communities in this way. Um, I think Maesha is, you know, Maesha is probably going to talk about Iron Fist, which was the infiltration program related to the Black Identity Extremist assessment. I think that Iron Fist was likely an assessment that came out of these these weakened Attorney General guidelines. Um, <clears throat> okay, so next slide, yeah, okay. So. These are the weak, these are the weakened protections that have largely been the law of the land since Patriot until Snowden. Again, these like big moments have to happen before anything can happen. Like the, the Patriot Act was kind of revisited, but no one knew anything, you know, it's all secrets. No one knew anything. You like you literally for anything to happen, someone needs to put their wife on the line and be a whistleblower for anything to happen in the, in the national security world. Um, I think the biggest revelation from Snowden was adoption of secret laws on how the intelligence community and the court were interpreting the law to conduct mass surveillance. Um, and that really launched the most recent fight in the, in the surveillance world. Um, so that, that big one was Snowden released that where basically that the FISA court had approved in one warrant the collection of all of the call detail records of basically everyone in America. So the, the metadata of every phone call that was happening in America. And that was a moment again, where we decided to revisit the surveillance fight. Um, and that's kind of where we are now that kicked off the most recent bait. Um, actually like some good news that the parts of the Patriot Act that sunset every number of years and sunset means that Congress needs to vote again to reauthorize them were not reauthorized over a year ago. So there has been movement. Um, that was a big fight in Congress. And with the help of folks like the squad um, and other champions, the conversation around surveillance has felt more grounded, I would say, in the past year or two, which has been helpful. I don't, I think Trump helped having, you know, like an outright bigot in the White House, like helped kind of ground like racist policing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's probably where we are. Yeah, totally. And I'm so sorry, y'all. We only have about um, 10 minutes. So I'm going to try and cover as much as I can about some of the other details that lead up to the Protect Black Descent campaign. Um, and if folks have questions, um, please feel free to like drop, drop them in the chat. Um, and we'll try to get to them too and open it up for conversation as well. Um, but just wanted to offer that since um, I don't want to keep people too much over. Um, but yeah, so so basically what we really wanted everyone to kind of take away from today's presentation is that, you know, again, groups like ours, so many folks are talking about all of these different surveillance tools and carceral tools. But the logic behind this stuff is really the same, right? Um, if you're black or brown or belonging to any marginalized group of people, you've been profiled and criminalized because that is the logic of living in a white supremacist society. <laughs> um, and so um, I'm gonna just dive right in and talk about what happened in 2017. Um, which is when the uh, foreign policy basic, and I liked, I appreciate Santa that you, you talked about assessments because I actually didn't know that either, <laughs> um, that foreign policy basically leaks uh, an FBI intelligence assessment on a new domestic terrorism category called um, black identity extremists. And they basically conclude that um, because of a perceived notion of racism, 
and police brutality marking since the uprisings in Ferguson, Ferguson, there's this rise of violent ideology within the Black community. Um, and so these Black identity extremists um, pose a violent threat to our public safety and especially law enforcement. And these are intelligence assessment reports get shared to literally every single local law enforcement agency in the country. So when this becomes exposed in 2017, media justice partners with the ACLU, the racial justice program of the ACLU, to file a FOIA request to better understand um, the scope of the government's surveillance and criminalization of our movements. Oop, sorry. And surprise, surprise, the FBI does not respond to our FOIA request. So we decide to escalate and launch an actual uh, lawsuit um, to get more documents around the scope of the FBI surveillance of our movements. But we also officially launch our Protect Black Descent campaign um, with a petition that many folks in our network helped uh, host with us um, to basically garner much more broader support for these three really basic but broad and important demands that we were making of congressional leaders at the time. Um, first demand meaning, uh, or including, excuse me, requiring the FBI to officially revoke the black identity extremist designation. We also wanted Congress to fully investigate the FBI and make all of the documents on black identity extremism public the same way that they in the church committee made those COINTEL documents public. And we know the extent of their surveillance then. We, do, we have a right to know what's going on right now. The third demand was forcing the FBI to testify and public hearing so we can actually understand um, who they're tagging as black identity extremists, what happens after that, how are they training every local uh, police department agency in the country to monitor the supposed uh, violent uh, threat coming from our communities. And after we launched this petition, we actually brought a group of activists from around the country, um, you know, engaged in abolition work, engaged in um, ending, uh, closing jails and ending mass incarceration with us to talk about their experience with police surveillance in their own communities. And we delivered these petitions to Congress. We had over 100,000 petition signatures. And literally just a few days after we left DC, another leak comes out. And it's important to say at this point that the FBI has publicly said in a hearing that they are no longer using this black identity extremist designation. This was in the spring and everyone was like, media justice, you won. It was like, not really. <laughs> Because history has shown, right? I know, right? I was like, y'all think we won? I'm more suspicious. Because <laughs> that was really quick, right? Um, you know, we know that these terms evolve. Sandy talked about Black separatists. Well, there's Black nationalists. There's They have so many different categories for calling us violent uh, uh, extremists and terrorists and all of that, right? Um, so... Days after we leave DC with you know our allies and comrades delivering these petitions, we hear of another uh, a leak by the Young Turks um, exposing more FBI surveillance of our movements. And not only do we see BIE still in these intelligence assessment documents, but we also see now a new category called racially motivated violent extremism, which basically conflates the real threat right, the, the real ongoing threat coming from white supremacists, you know, it's important to say at this time, El Paso had just happened, we are a year after Charlottesville, so we are continuing to see a, uh, the, the legacy of white supremacist violence um, in our country, conflating that violence with the supposed threat coming from Black identity extremists and other left radical groups like Antifa, right? And we also know from these documents that they developed a program called Iron Fist to quote unquote counter the, the threat coming from black identity extremists. So these documents basically show us that the FBI is lying, right? Because not only are these terms still in, in existence, right? But when they are publicly saying that they're most concerned about white supremacist violence, documents show like this, that black identity extremists was their top counterterrorism priority. And I'm sorry that I have to use the state's language in this presentation. I just wanna be consistent with what um, has been shared, right? 
Um, so from there, we continue our advocacy. We continue meeting with different members on the Hill. Um, you know, Sandy's been a great partner in that work um, with just talking to different staffers and offices that sit on the relevant committees that actually have the authority and oversight over the FBI. So this would be the House Homeland Security Committee, the Oversight Committee, and the Judiciary Committee. Um, and we've continued to raise our, our concerns and our demands. We've also continued to get documents from our, our lawsuit. I posted one um, on this slide. If you go to the ACLU's website, you can see every single batch that we've received from our litigation. Um, as you can see, they're heavily redacted, but you find little like interesting information, like they were at the Million Man March <laughs> or like they did a vehicle stop, you know, like weird stuff like that, really low ball kind of like information. But one thing that we did discover um, before the pandemic was that of the 1 million potential responsive documents to our FOIA request on you know, black identity extremism and all these designations, up to one third of those pages are on open investigations of black folks that have been labeled as domestic terrorists. So like, this is a really serious, like, like priority program within the FBI, like full stop, right? So now we find ourselves in the pandemic, right? Um, and we also find ourselves in the largest mass mobilization against police violence, state violence. Um, and in, in the midst of those uprisings, we launch another petition, but we also expand our, our demands to really tackle the sort of surveillance tools and all of these um, powers that the government has that we know will be inevitably used to further criminalize people who have a right to be out on the street. So our demands included ceasing state and local grants for surveillance tools, limiting surveillance authorities of Border Patrol, ICE, DEA. This is why we brought in the war on drugs. <laughs> um, because one thing that was surprising to me is when we started to see articles mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, ICE and CPD, C CBP over Minneapolis with facial recognition drones and all of this equipment. I had no idea that the DEA would be called for a protest, right? Um, rolling back unwarranted surveillance through the Patriot Act and closing any loopholes that uh, Sandy was just talking about um, within national security laws that can be used to surveil and criminalize protesters. There was a lot of energy. <laughs> and to responding to the way that the police were responding to the uprisings around the police, right? Like we saw the police double down with more violence, with more surveillance to largely peaceful, although it doesn't really matter, protest, right? And what has happened since then is the crisis that we saw on January 6th. And this is why we've maybe uh, redundantly so talked so much about moments of crisis, because just as we've seen this year, the attack at the nation's capital has been used to justify policing, to justify surveillance, and justify the police use of all sorts of tools to combat the rise of violent extremism, which is just the old like uh, issue of white supremacist violence in this country, right? And so we've been out, you know, organizing, um, you know, continuing to having meetings, had an advocacy day, had a briefing back in February to push back on this narrative that um, surveillance can deliver us safety. We know it wasn't the lack of resources. We know it wasn't training that led up to the attack, right? Um, it's the racist, violent, and corrupt history of law enforcement that allowed that to happen. And no amount of technology is going to take the bias out of the uh, policing, the racist racism out of policing, and the police can't keep us safe anyways, right? Um, so this was sort of the demands that we've been making lately. But I just wanted to also touch on the fact that at Media Justice, we also drive campaigns that disrupt the use of surveillance tools and carceral tools and other spaces, right? So we consistently, you know, support bans against um, the, the police use of facial recognition. 
We take on companies like Amazon. This week, we just launched Eyes on Amazon because in the middle of the uprisings last summer, everyone making their pledges, saying they're standing in defense of Black lives. Jeff Bezos is happy to lose customers, except the police, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, he, they made this announcement of temporarily banning the, the police use of their uh, facial recognition tool. Um, and we've launched a campaign to, to basically demand that they keep that ban. And then there's, you know, other carceral tools like electronic monitoring um, that just shifts the site of incarceration away from prisons and jails and in our homes and our communities. And there was a one-on-one -on, -one on, on EM a few weeks ago. So I know we're, we're out of time. I'm sorry, I'm not going further, further into these details, but but I'm definitely down to stay on and answer any questions you have. Yeah. But some of the main key, key takeaways I wanted to just share with folks is that surveillance is rooted and shaped by power, right? Like who has the power to watch? Who has the power to own its infrastructure? Who has the power to even own that information or the data in this case? And it's important to acknowledge that in today's society, right? So much of the tech that we're using isn't necessarily built with our interests our hopes and dreams in mind, right? Um, the data produced from these tools is property that we don't own. The way that we were talking about biometric data during slavery, like that was stuff that, you know, enslaved folks did not own. And then, you know, my last point here is that we're continuing to fight you know, the, the, the racist system of, of, of the policing system and the carceral system. But now we're fighting against this new iteration of policing that has been partially fueled by tech companies who are trading in our privacy and safety for, for profit. So I'm gonna stop there and see if folks have any questions. Yeah, we've got someone in the chat asking about making the demands we have available for folks to view. We can drop yep. yeah, the link. I can, um, for sure. There's so many letters and petitions. I'd be happy to like write in an email and share with the network team or whoever um, all of the previous sign-on letters we've done. Um, I feel like the petitions are kind of closed at this point because we delivered another set of petitions um, in February in light of the uh, attack at the Capitol because there was so much you know, um, interest to expand domestic terrorism laws. Um, but right now we are launching a campaign called Eyes on Amazon in light of this impending deadline on, on June 10th. And so we've got, uh, we're doing this action actually with one of our partners at the Athena Coalition. Um, and so you'll actually get to learn about how monopoly power and the concentration of wealth is fueling surveillance power. You'll also get to learn about the um, nature of workplace surveillance, hearing directly from workers about um, the surveillance practices at the, at the warehouses. Um, but you'll also learn about Ring and the criminalization and surveillance in our communities through these video doorbells, which we just found out a couple of weeks ago, the LAPD had requested Amazon Ring footage to surveil protesters during the uprisings last summer. Um, so this collaboration between tech and, 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 and the police is really nothing new either. Um, and, and of course, all of the other surveillance tools that Amazon has. So short answer is yes, I will definitely um, share all of the sign-on letters um, that demonstrate the, the, the general demands that we've been making over the last few years. There's another question in the chat, Asia. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. I want to know what can grassroots organizers do to counter infiltration practices that keep morphing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, Teresa, do you mind talking about Defend Our Movements in the series that you did? It's not necessarily, I don't know if that's the best answer for infiltration, but you know, we do do a lot of work around digital security or digital safety practices. Um, so yeah, do you mind if I pass that to you? Teresa or um, Dulani, do you wanna talk about Defend Our Movements? I can talk about it a little bit. I know that we started to do digital safety trainings after um, the election of Trump. 
um, because our because of our network members, because network members were saying, "Hey, we really want to understand what encryption is, what's WhatsApp, what's Signal, like what's what's the difference between the two, like just kind of um, sharpening some of our digital safety like practices." And we've continued to do them over the years, but they've kind of evolved and, and shifted over time and last year Teresa and Adrian did a great series on this so um I'll pass it to y'all yeah, talk this, a little bit more this is Adrian um DeMarcus I'm happy to share more information about and for all of our participants about the upcoming um trainings that we're going to be hosting in our MJLI um and we also have some resources that we can share that are related to this because that is it's like a it's a practice you know it's not just a, a one-time conversation yeah i would just say like to specifically the infiltration question like i think what media justice is doing with the securing the movements protecting the movements um digital security stuff is the best thing you can do like if cops are going to try to infiltrate particularly like in person or they do it in social media it's very difficult to stop them from doing it. Like they're going to do it. And that was, that's kind of part of it is you kind of tear your movement apart because they are sowing distrust. So like, it's just, it's super hard to guard against. I have a question for the group. Like, is this something that folks here would be interested in working a little bit more closely with us on, because we could sure use the help. <laughs> and we sure want to connect with like other people on the ground too, because I, I, I recognize I've talked so much about like Congress and like these, but that's not the only strategy. You know what I mean? This is just what we've done so far. And I'm really open and really like curious to know, like, what should we do differently? How can this connect better to the work that you all are leading um, so we can strengthen and defend our movements in a much better way. So. If I may, I'm so grateful for you. <laughs> I have been looking for you. I'm so glad that we have found each other. The work in Galveston County is I can't even, I don't, I'm a wordsmith and can't even find the words right now from inmates that have died in police custody at the county jail to like, we just had this slab event and they were doing nothing but driving their cars. And these folk were in tactical gear in the whole nine. And out of all the other events we have up and around this Island, only the people, black people and people of color were met with such aggression. So yes, I definitely need to plug in and see what we can do about getting my network attached so we can get this work done. For sure. I'm down with that. I will reach out to you, Roxy. I'm so glad that we met too. I see DeMarcus. Yep, I got you. Who else? I'm going to send all of y'all an email no matter what, <laughs> but I want to make sure I remember which, which, which names. Very... Tiffany. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Awesome. Making a note. Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to find my notes doc to help us close out. <laughs> Um, give me one second, but I appreciate y'all staying on past uh, 10 after really, really appreciate it. And I, yeah, let's be in touch. So yeah, I mean, I think that's it. I'm sorry, y'all. Can I get some help closing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you everyone for for coming and participating. Um, there is, um, if you have time, there's at the end of the participant guide, there's um, room for feedback. Um, so anything that you appreciated or you wanna see more of, um, like a future workshop, let us know. And again, like uh, Maisha mentioned, we'll, we will be in touch with um, some other resources and ways to plug in. So thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. Thanks y'all.
Talk to you soon. Thank you, Cameron. This was impactful, ladies and gents and everybody that's on. I'm just so grateful for you guys. Keep up the good work. We're going to push through. Yeah. Thank you. Be in touch. Yeah. I will. I'm on it right now. <laughs> Great. I love it. <laughs> love the energy. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Sorry, y'all. We ran way over. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you to our interpreters who stayed. You can you could leave now. Thank you. Muchisima gracia. Um, <laughs> I guess, yeah, we can use like 15 minutes or so to debrief. I can take notes on this um, run of show doc. Ooh, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>